Uh, my name is Jason Crawford. I write about the history of technology and the philosophy of progress. And you can find most of my writing on my uh, website, rootsofprogress.org. And I'm here today to talk about the progress movement uh, that I'm a part of. Now, I don't usually talk about myself very much when I speak, but for today's topic, I thought it was appropriate to give um, really a personal story by way of intro. But before I dive into it, I'd like to learn a little bit about you. Raise your hand if you, the first time that you read uh, an Ayn Rand book was at least one year ago. I'm guessing it's gonna be most people. Okay, keep your hand up if uh, the first time was at least five years ago. 10 years. Oh, first time ever. Yeah, first time ever, yeah, right? <laughs> 20 years. Okay, now keep your hand up if the first time you read an Ayn Rand book was at least 30 years ago. Yeah, Gina. <laughs> okay, great. This, uh, yeah, okay, a good, a good handful. Okay, you can put your hands in now. So all of you with your hands up at the end are the only ones who've been in this longer than me. What about 40 and 60? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> you can, can show off later. Um, so I, I first read The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged 30 years ago in 1992. I was 12. Uh, and these books made a deep impression on me. Uh, from Rand, I first learned a deep respect for reason, science, technology, business, industry, capitalism, and for the people who drive these things forward, the scientists, the inventors, the entrepreneurs. Also from Rand, I first learned a deep respect for the power of fundamental ideas especially the power of philosophy. I fell in love with philosophy as a teenager, uh, but I was really bored by history. I hated history as a subject. I avoided it pretty much whenever I could, certainly in school at least. Um, I took zero history classes in college, really felt like a waste of time. <clears throat> but I did take philosophy classes, and uh, I ran the local objectivist club at my university, and in my teens and 20s, I had countless hours of discussion, debate, and argument with all sorts of people about uh, politics, philosophy, ideology, and, and all kinds of related topics. And in that time, over those years, I learned a few things. One thing I learned was that uh, avoiding history had been a big mistake. Uh, I needed history to understand the world whether it was the war on terrorism, or uh, the financial crisis, or uh, healthcare. In all of these issues, if I didn't know where we had come from and how we'd gotten to where we were, uh, I was really at a loss to understand the world or where we should go next. And conversely, learning those things was extremely illuminating. The other thing I realized was, honestly, I just wasn't getting through to people most of the time. You've probably had this experience, right? Anybody who's ever had a conversation with somebody over, over politics, you just, you realize quickly, you're very, it's very rare that someone actually changes their mind in one of those conversations. So uh, remedying these, well, remedying the first one was straightforward. I won't say it was easy, but it was straightforward. I had to go learn history. And in my mid-20s, I started uh, making up for the history education that I had skipped or neglected and giving myself a, a remedial history education. The other one was not so straightforward to address, but I decided that instead of getting angry with people for not agreeing with me, or getting frustrated with the whole endeavor and just sort of giving up, that I was gonna get curious. And so I decided to start listening more than I talked, to start asking people what they thought more than, or at least as much as I told them what I thought. Um, and I would ask them why they believed that and why they believed that and why, peeling back the layers of this onion until we got to really deep fundamental issues. And I tried to build a model in my head, a picture of someone else's worldview and you know, how they understood the world, how they looked at the world. And one big thing I realized was people focus on different problems in the world and in society that they think are the important salient ones. So imagine um, a conversation between a left-wing environmentalist and a right-wing deficit hawk. Um, 
the environmentalist is going to say, look, climate change is the number one issue of our day. It is the biggest problem facing society. We've got to rearrange all of our you know, government and industry. Everything has to be focused on this. Um, otherwise, the consequences will be devastating. And, we'll, and then you know, the deficit hawk breaks in. He says, no, 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 come on. Climate change, totally overhyped. Um, uh, but what nobody's paying attention to is the national debt. $24 trillion of national debt is a ticking time bomb that's going to... Okay. And then at this point, a social justice activist comes into the room right? and says, no, you're both wrong. Racism and racial strife and inequality, these are the most pressing issues of the day. They are tearing apart the fabric of our society if we don't... Okay, you get the idea. How are we ever going to agree on solutions when we don't even agree on the problems? So this led me to ask myself, well, what problems do I care about? What problems and what opportunities? And why do I care so deeply about reason, science, technology, industry, capitalism? Um, why do these things matter to me? Why do I want to talk to people about them? Why do I want to keep learning about them? Why is it central to my worldview? And I realized that. Uh, a major part of the foundation for this was a keen appreciation of the story of human progress. Understanding how dramatically economic production and living standards had changed in the last couple hundred years, and how little they changed in all of the tens of thousands of years before that. How most people just a couple hundred years ago lived in what today would be considered extreme poverty, and how lucky we were to be born at the time when we were born. And so the more I thought about this, the more I began to see the history of progress as a key part of the validation of the Enlightenment and its core ideas, such as reason and liberty. And so I thought to myself, well, if the story of progress is that core to my worldview, I should really understand it better. I mean, I should learn what that, how that actually happened. I should go study the details. I should be able to tell the story. I should be able to, I mean, I should learn, like, what, what really was the Industrial Revolution? Now, my understanding of this five years ago was quite thin. It was very weak. It was sort of like, well, it was that time with trains and steam engines and stuff. Uh, steel, I think. There was some steel and cotton something or other. You know, but I, I don't think I could have said much more than that. That's not enough. Not if you're going to say the Industrial Revolution was one of the greatest things ever to happen in history, and we should pay attention to what caused that and make sure our society continues to be innovative like that. You know, if you're going to make an argument like that, you should know what you're talking about. So I started uh, reading. Uh, this just started by picking up some books and, and trying to read. Um, and so I started kind of with this focus on the Industrial Revolution. But then, very fortuitously, I, uh, I ran across this article in The Atlantic, late 2016, early 2017, under the headline, Progress Isn't Natural, by Joel Mokir, who's become one of my favorite economic historians. And uh, Mokir argued in this article and in his book, A Culture of Growth, that uh, the, I, the very idea of progress is actually a relatively new idea, that it didn't exist in most places and times in human history, and that it really arose in the West, uh, roughly between Columbus and Newton, say the 16th and 17th centuries. This was fascinating to me, and uh, I, that clinched it for me. I was not merely going to study the Industrial Revolution. I was going to study the entire story of human progress. That was my goal. This began as an intellectual hobby, a side project. Um, at first, it really just began as what books am I going to read next? At the time, I was in the tech industry. I was a CEO of a startup. Uh, I was you know, working extremely hard. Uh, I didn't have time for you know, projects, per se. All I had time for was to read some nonfiction books in the evening, you know, occasionally, to, to relax. Um, and so the question was really just, what book am I going to pick up next? And so this was a theme that I, that I thought I could use for my ongoing self-education. I figured it would take me 10 years. Um, but a few months in, I was just so fascinated by what I was reading that I thought, you know, maybe I'll just start a little blog uh, and just put out a few brief informal notes on the kinds of things that I'm reading and what I'm learning. And, um, you know, I deliberately, I said to myself, I don't, I'm not going to care who reads this, how many people read it. I'm not going to try to make it a big thing. It'll probably just be a handful of my friends, and that's fine. 
In fact, one of the first posts I put on the blog was, don't read this blog, <laughs> which was a little bit of reverse psychology, a little bit of under-promise, over-deliver, and a little bit of honest just kind of uh, you know, advertising that this was not going to, I was not going to try to do like big, long, polished essays or anything. It was just going to be brief notes. But over the next year or two, uh, I started to write more. I started to find my voice. I started to get into writing longer and more substantive essays. I wrote about the history of cement, um, the history of the Haber-Bosch process, which creates synthetic fertilizer, why we use alternating current instead of direct current for our electricity grid, how we uh, navigate tools for ocean navigation, such as the sextant or the marine chronometer. And then one day, uh, I wrote, uh, over the weekend, I wrote this essay on sort of a fun, quirky topic. And I titled it, Why Did We Wait So Long for the Bicycle? It was a history of the bicycle. And I posed this question, why is it that we, the bicycle wasn't invented until the late 1800s? When it does, it's not based on, obviously based on any kind of scientific principle, right? You'd, you wouldn't be that surprised to see bicycles in like ancient Rome. But, but, they, but we, they didn't, right? And uh, this article was my first breakout viral hit. It turned out to be really popular. And uh, you can ask me the, the actual content of the article if you want to know the history of the bicycle in the question period. But um, it, it, got, it got posted around. Uh, it sort of went viral. It got put, a lot of positive tweets. It went on people's blogs and so forth. And uh, my audience started growing for real, like for the first time. Um, my email list about 10 x overnight. I think I started with like 50 people, and within a couple of days, I had you know 500 or more. And it wasn't just uh, random people. Some of the people promoting this uh, article were economists and economic historians, like uh, Anton Howes, who's in the upper left there, uh, an economic historian who's become uh, a friend and colleague since then. So I thought, oh wow, okay. Even professionals are finding some value in my work. This is not, this is not totally amateur hour. I'm, I'm actually delivering some value here. That's cool. And then, another just fortuitous coincidence was two weeks later, this article appeared in The Atlantic under the headline, We Need a New Science of Progress. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this article because this was sort of the initiation of the progress movement. This article galvanized a new intellectual movement and community. Uh, so it was written by uh, two authors, one a Silicon Valley uh, CEO and the other a, an academic economist. Patrick Collison is the co-founder and CEO of Stripe, an extremely successful uh, company in financial technology, payments technology. Uh, might be the most valuable private company in the world today, or it's very close. Um, he's an extremely smart and competent guy. And uh, then the other co-author was Tyler Cowen who is an economist at George Mason University and who runs the Mercatus Center there and has authored a whole bunch of books and stuff. Um, and this article said, basically called for a new field of progress studies, an interdisciplinary field that would cut across history and economics and other related disciplines uh, and that would be more prescriptive rather than purely descriptive as many of those fields are. Something that would tell us what do we do to get more progress. Well. Um, this article, like I said, galvanized a new intellectual community. Dozens of journalists and bloggers uh, wrote their own responses to it, including myself. I wrote something a little while later titled Progress Studies as a Moral Imperative, in which I said that if you look at this history of progress and you care about human life, if human well-being is your standard of value, then you have to be a little awestruck at these last couple hundred years of human history. And you have to ask three basic questions. One, how did we get here? Two, why did it take so long? And three, how do we keep it going? So that was what I put at the core of what I saw as progress studies and certainly what motivates and animates my own work. And I wasn't the only one. Like I said, there were dozens of responses. Patrick Collison started collecting them on his blog. You don't have to read these, but just get a sense of this is, this is like a half or a third of the list. Uh, this page scrolls on. There were, there were a whole lot of people talking about this. And I think the great thing was really that we all started talking to each other. Right? So all the people on this list could see, oh, you're interested in this concept. Oh, yeah, you're interested in progress. Um, and, and people could get together. There's a bunch of people who'd been interested in this for a long time, but we had just hadn't had a, there wasn't a name for it. Uh, there wasn't a name for the community or the interest or the thing that we had in common to, to create, to, to get those conversations started. 
Before I knew it, there was a, a Slack group. That's like an online discussion group for uh, for progress stuff, and I was one of the first people invited. There was a meetup in San Francisco that was actually hosted at the offices of Founders Fund, the VC uh, co-founded by Peter Thiel. And I was invited as a speaker. I gave a talk on the history of iron and steel, which I was researching at the time. And long story short, uh, a couple months later, I decided to really take a huge step. I, I made a midlife career change. I left the tech industry, and I decided to go full time on the research and writing that I've been doing. Um, today, I have a Twitter audience of over 24,000 people. I've written over 150 essays, uh, not only on the history of technology, but also on the philosophy of progress. Uh, I created a, a high school course uh, commissioned by a private high school, the Academy of Thought and Industry. The course is on the, uh, the history of technology. Uh, I've written editorials for the uh, MIT Technology Review. I've been interviewed about progress in uh, outlets like Vox and the BBC. And I am working on a book uh, tentatively titled The Story of Industrial Civilization Towards a New Philosophy of Progress for the 21st Century. And I recently completed a 13-part lecture series uh, based on the book following the outline with, uh, with a, a one or two hour talk for each chapter. And it's not just me. So like I said, there's a whole community around this. For example, I mentioned Patrick Collison and his company Stripe. Well, they have created a publishing arm where they publish books, uh, and many of them related to progress. Uh, for instance, Where Is My Flying Car? Uh, a work of futurism that, uh, that came out recently. I was, by the way, a consulting editor on that. Um, the book, Scientific Freedom, the Elixir of Civilization, which discusses how we fund, organize, and manage scientific research and how that has gone wrong and how it can be improved. Uh, and also uh, a book by the aforementioned economist Tyler Cowen uh, called Stubborn Attachments, in which he makes the moral case, or the case for economic growth as a moral imperative. There is a quarterly online magazine called Works in Progress that has just started up in the last couple of years with progress studies related writing. I've written uh, for them. They have a lot of good articles. Recommend it. There is New Things Under the Sun, which describes itself as a living literature review of uh, social science research in innova about innovation, uh, basically the, the economics of innovation. And this is a great resource if you want to understand what uh, what the uh, field of economics has figured out about uh, innovation, invention, and, and economic growth. There is a recently launched DC policy think tank called the Institute for Progress, which is exactly what it says on the tin. There's even an effort to revive the World's Fair and to bring back the kind of grand expositions uh, that we saw you know, from the late 1800s until you know, at least the 1960s. Uh, if you think of like 1964 in Flushing, Queens, in the 1930s they had them in Chicago and New York, the 1915 Pan American uh, Exposition in San Francisco, those kind of grand, ambitious uh, ex exhibitions of progress and, and a vision of a technological future that we could all live in. I'm excited for this. There is also a, uh, there is funding for projects like this, so in particular, uh, Tyler Cowen and the Mercatus Center have created a fund called Emergent Ventures, a grant and fellowship program. Uh, this fund actually wrote me my very first check when I was going full time and helped me get started. And they've got uh, hundreds of, of, uh, of grantees by now. There's a whole bunch of great bloggers. Here's just a handful of ones that I came up with very quickly. Um, I mentioned Anton Howes before. He writes about uh, the history of English invention in particular, at uh, Age of Invention. Brian Potter writes a lot about the construction industry and goes really deep. Uh, James Pethokoukas at AEI has a, a good newsletter called Faster Please. And the, uh, uh, Eric Gilliam and Dwarkish Patel are some uh, young up-and-comers with also good blogs and podcasts that I recommend. And it's not just the, uh, the bloggers, it's also traditional media is getting into the game. The Atlantic has announced a, uh, an initi a progress initiative um, to, uh, shoot, I took my glasses off, I can barely read this. Um, anyway, check it out, theatlantic.com slash progress. It's about how we you know, address and solve uh, some of the biggest problems in the world. That, is being, that initiative is being uh, spearheaded by Derek Thompson at The Atlantic, who's uh, one of my favorite progress journalists. Uh, he also coined the term abundance agenda for what politicians should be focused on. Um, rather than merely uh, you know, trying to redistribute what we have, how about we focus on creating more? 
Noah Smith at Bloomberg uh, has written a bunch about progress, and he's interviewed me. Uh, Ezra Klein, one of the former you know, co-founders of Vox, now at the New York Times, coined the term supply-side progressivism. So if you're, even if you're progressive and you want, to, uh, you, know, you want to redistribute wealth and help the poor, well, again, there has to be some wealth to redistribute. Remember that line from Atlas Shrugged? The goods are here. How did they get here? Somehow. Well, <laughs> some people are, are realizing, wait, they don't just get here somehow. They have to get here somehow, right? Um, and, uh, and we should focus on that. Um, Matt Iglesias is one of the other co-founders of Vox. He's now independent, but he's also written uh, a bunch of things about progress, including the, uh, a very important theme, the need for energy abundance. The need to uh, not only you know, maintain the amount of energy usage that we have in the economy, but to continue to increase it. Unsurprisingly, Silicon Valley uh, is also very supportive, including a number of top investors. Founders Fund, again, I mentioned Peter Thiel's VC firm, wrote an essay, this is actually predates the progress movement, is one of the precursors to it, called What Happened to the Future, where they talked about the, some of the ambitious you know, things that people thought were going to happen like in the 60s and how many of them didn't come true, um, such as nuclear power or you know, the, a continued space program. Um, they talked about, so they talked about a number of ways in this essay that we are actually, the growth has actually slowed down and that we may be entering a period of stagnation. Peter Thiel, uh, so a, a line that was associated with this article uh, and, that, and that got associated with Peter Thiel is this, we wanted flying cars, we got 140 characters. Right? It's the, sort of a snide reference to Twitter, you know, which used to be limited to 140 characters. Um, they doubled that to 280. Peter Thiel was not very impressed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, this is a little too snide, in my opinion, about the, you know, kind of dismissing all of the internet as like 140 characters. But, uh, but there's a very important point in here, which is, you know, we should have had the flying cars as well as the internet, and the Concorde, and the nuclear power, and the et cetera. <clears throat> Andreessen Horowitz, uh, another very well-known you know, top VC firm, has also gotten into this. Mark Andreessen wrote an essay, It's Time to Build. And when, this, when the original uh, version of this essay came out, the title was in all caps. But it was just totally in your face. It's time to build. Um, I'm sad that they, that they reformatted that. Um, but this, this essay was just all about how we need to focus, you know, get, get out of the bureaucratic mire that so much of us of America seems to be in and focus on getting things done again. Um, another partner at uh, Andreessen Horowitz has, uh, has emphasized this through a term American dynamism that she's been writing about. So that gives you a sense of just like generally, you know, who's in this movement, what are they saying, what does this consist of? I want to pause for a moment and ask a little bit about the origins of this. Where did this come from? And what, what are the core ideas? So I want to acknowledge up front, there's been a long history of writing in progress. Um, uh, I was certainly not the first to ask the questions that I asked about progress, and, and, and nobody in this movement was the first. Uh, you could go all the way back to, or you know, prob probably even earlier, but I mean, I just chose some kind of representative things here. Julian Simon and his work on resources and the, the, the ultimate resource. Um, again, I mentioned the historian Joel McKeer, who's been writing for decades, has a bunch of great books. Uh, or uh, Deirdre McCluskey, her, her bourgeois trilogy, she coined the term the great enrichment to talk about this in, increase in, in living standards over the last couple hundred years. Um, Johan Norberg and Greg Easterbrook more recently have written books with progress in the very title. Uh, Matt Ridley, Virginia Postrel have written about the nature of innovation. So there was this long, uh, and, and Virginia Postrel coined the term uh, dynamism and the, the, talked about a dynamist coalition, which she says is now finally coming together some 25 years later under the banner of progress studies. Uh, but in the last uh, several years, I think there was uh, a number of kind of more recent strains of thinking and intellectual communities that formed the context in which this progress studies thing got kicked off. Um, so the libertarians, some of them were thinking about progress. In particular, got to give credit to Marion Tupi at Cato, who 10 years ago uh, created humanprogress.org and started sounding this theme. And there's a bunch of interesting articles there. There was also, in the last several years, some, a lot of discussion about the Enlightenment and a number of books written on the topic, perhaps most prominently Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, which I'll return to uh, in a little bit. There was also this growing concern by some people about 
whether we are actually entering a period of technological stagnation. Not zero growth, but slower growth than we've seen in uh, previous decades. Like I said, Peter Thiel was one of the first to sound this alarm. Tyler Cowen picked up on this very early and wrote a book, The Great Stagnation, in 2011, where he talked about this theme. Uh, another economist, Robert Gordon, wrote a book, The Rise and Fall of American Growth, where he documented some of you know, how this is happening. Um, side note, really excellent history book. I totally disagree with his conclusions. So first 600 pages are great. Last 150, worth reading, but I, I, I very disagree. Check out my review of his book on my blog. There was uh, another community that uh, goes by the name eco-modernism, or there's some other terms you might hear, eco-pragmatism and so forth. This is basically a, um, a version of environmentalism that is pro-technology and pro-human. Uh, it's a community of people who take uh, environmental concerns seriously, but want to uh, solve them in a way that you know, keeps us moving forward and that uh, you know, takes advantage of technology and is kind of you know, saving, more saving the earth for humans versus from humans. Uh, the term eco-modernism was coined by the Breakthrough Institute and uh, also associated with Stuart Brand and the Long Now Foundation. There's a whole community uh, around the concept of meta-science, uh, people looking at how is science organized and managed and funded, and has that gone wrong and perhaps gotten a little too bureaucratic um, these days and maybe a little too susceptible to consensus and groupthink, and is that actually slowing science down? Are there better ways to organize and manage it? And then within the people who uh, think and write about global development, there were some people who started really focusing on uh, the data and the facts. Hans Rosling was one of the first. He's got a really excellent TED talk, by the way, about the washing machine. It's not, it's not just about the washing machine, but look it up. Um, but he would point to the facts of uh, you know, economic development, even in poor countries over the last several decades. And there's been a lot of wealth creation in uh, really in, in most of the countries of the world. Um, we're not at all in the place we were in you know, the 1960s. Most people hadn't realized that, and Hans Rosling really got those facts out. Max Roser is kind of his spiritual successor. Um, started a site called Our World in Data, where uh, he collects and writes about, and his team collect and write about some of the, the same uh, things, um, things like economic growth uh, around the world, um, who has electricity, who has clean water, who's getting vaccinated. Um, who, uh, who can read right, literacy rates and so forth. And w when you look at the data, almost all of the stories are actually quite positive. The trends are in a good direction. One reason why I think a lot of this, you know, people have been focusing more on this in recent years is that if you buy into a declinist narrative, if you think the world is going to hell, then it's very natural to blame the fundamental institutions of modern society. Uh, including the government, the university, the media. Now, of course, you can criticize all those things. You can have, I mean, I have beefs with all of those. But, you know, fundamentally, science, the rule of law, um, media and university institutions, all of these things are sort of fundamentally good, maybe in need of reform. Um, but if you buy into the declinist narrative, then, you know, there's a no, it's, it's very easy to just come to the conclusion we should just burn it all down and to become very nihilistic and to say that we should, you know, if we just raised the structures of modern society to the ground, no matter what replaced it would have to be better. Um, and so I think a number of people have been looking to the history of progress, as I said earlier, as the validation of the core ideas of the Enlightenment. That was really the theme of Steven Pinker's book. Most of this book is about progress. And uh, ultimately, he attributes it to um, reason, science, and humanism, which is what he identifies as, as some of the core ideas of the Enlightenment. I think that thesis is fundamentally correct. What are the core ideas of this movement? Right? So what do the people who are coming together and discussing, um, they don't agree on everything. What are some core shared things they have in common? Fundamentally, a conviction that progress is real and important, both historically and also in the future, that progress is something that can continue, not a one-time fluke of history. Also, the recognition that it is not automatic or inevitable. Progress does not unfold inexorably according to some divine plan or even according to natural law. As some thinkers, you know, the most optimistic thinkers of the Enlightenment, 17th and 18th centuries, actually believed. Uh, instead, progress is up to us. It is up to our 
effort and choice and agency, we can shape the future and in some way control our destiny. There's also in this community uh, a very empirical mindset, and I say that in the best possible sense of the term, looking to facts, evidence, history, data, case studies in order to understand the world. And there is a long-term mindset, a willingness to get all the way to the root causes of progress, and an understanding that these may be found in culture and institutions, and that those things are slow to change, right? So that this could be a very long-term, even a generational project. And the conclusion that naturally falls out of this is we should study progress and understand its root causes in order to preserve and protect progress and you know, ultimately maybe even to accelerate it for the good of humanity. I've boiled these things down into really two very core ideas. This is, I would say, about half descriptive and half prescriptive me trying to focus the movement and, and pointing on what I think the core ideas are and should be. One is humanism, the idea that human well-being is the standard of value and the standard by which we even say that progress exists and is good. And the other is agency, the idea that uh, progress is up to us and that some, in, in some sense the future is up to us, that we are not just helpless uh, you know, in, in, in the tides, you know, being carried along on the tide of history, that we can shape the future that we can solve problems. Now, this is a philosophic movement, as I think you can tell. There are some core sort of philosophic premises. But it is not itself a philosophy, of course. It doesn't have its own epistemology and metaphysics and so forth. When I talk about the philosophy of progress, I use that in the same sense as you might talk about the philosophy of science, the philosophy of law, you know, and so forth. So, you know, as I said, we don't agree on everything. So some things that we disagree on are the moral foundations of all of this. Um, within the movement, there are a good number of uh, utilitarians who want the, sort of the greatest good for the greatest number. And there are uh, you know, obviously some folks like me who approach it in a more individualist and egoistic uh, way. And so there's an ongoing discussion about that. Related, of course, is political philosophy. There are some you know, in the movement who are, you know, who maybe would identify as libertarians who say, look, the solution to progress is to get the government out of the way. And there's some who are, you know, might call themselves more progressive, who think the, the, one of the best ways we could drive progress is through massive government investment in progress. And that, too, is an ongoing discussion. And one I've chosen to embrace as a healthy debate. I think if we debate these things, on the basis of a shared value and standard of, of human progress, it um, provides a, a context for us to have productive discussions. Um, and related, you know, I think people uh, probably disagree some about what are the root causes of progress. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead uh, for time. So despite all this, I am very excited about this movement. Um, and in fact, I've chosen to devote myself and my career to it. I see people coming together around a real substantive value. <clears throat> um, and it's a value that is more fundamental than politics. It's really a view about the nature of human beings and our relationship to, well, nature. It's something positive rather than negative, and it's not reactive or defensive. We're not pointing at some bad thing or trend in the world and saying, whoa, we'd better counter that. Let's mount a defense. We're starting from a deep place of authenticity and saying, what do we care about? What matters? Um, and, uh, and then going out and learning more about it and, and communicating to the world. And the movement is attracting smart and successful people, people I am you know, happy to associate with, to be around, uh, to talk to, people I learn a lot from uh, and, and, and just find my intellectual world is enriched by being around them. Where does the movement go from here? I think the most important thing for us to do right now is to continue to build out the intellectual foundations of this movement, to develop the philosophy of progress. Um, and more broadly, I think we need the history of progress. I think we need the philosophy of progress. I think we need work on solutions to the problems of the modern world. And we need more work on a vision of the kind of future that we can create. Just a few examples of work that I think needs to be done in the history of progress. I would love to see a great one-volume book about agriculture and how, uh, we, how we, the history of agriculture and how we got to the modern world of industrialized agriculture and why that's a very good thing and why it 
why it is the way it is, why we use fertilizers, why we, use, why we have irrigation, um, and why all of these things, you know, where the, the benefits outweigh the costs. Similarly with plastic, I think there's no, I've read like two books on plastic. I don't think there's a single one volume history of plastic that does it justice. It is an amazing wonder material and it's, you know, it's treated as kind of a cheap, tawdry, you know, almost a joke. Similar with the automobile. People love to hate the automobile. I think it's one of the most amazing inventions ever. Somebody should really, you know, do it justice. Um, within the philosophy of progress, there are a lot of challenges to be tackled. Is progress healthy? Is it an addiction, as some people say? And how could you even tell the difference? Um, is progress sustainable? And what does that mean? What is sustainability? What is it that we want to sustain? And how do we do so? How do we have both progress and safety? Creating safety is a part of progress, but progress is messy. It naturally creates risk as well. How do we control and manage that? How do we make faster progress over time and get safer over time as well? I think we need progress-oriented solutions to the problems of the day, the real problems and the ones that you know, everybody talks about. Um, we need real uh, work by smart legal minds on the appropriate legal frameworks, both for existing and emerging technologies. Uh, new technologies create new issues within law. Um, we need a progress-oriented approaches to environmental problems. We need uh, an answer to questions about physical and mental health problems, especially the ones created by progress, like obesity. Um, and we need some serious thought about how do we make sure that progress doesn't just enable oppression and authoritarianism, especially when it is combined in regimes that don't respect individual rights. Finally, we need a bold, ambitious vision of the future, the technological future that it is up to us to create and that we desperately want to live in. Uh, my vision for the future includes, for example, technologies such as longevity or anti-aging, giving us all as many years of healthy life as we choose. Nanotechnology for materials and manufacturing. Uh, nuclear power, including fission and fusion and exploring and settling uh, space. So we're going to need dozens, probably hundreds, of public intellectuals in this sphere of progress studies. And so I am excited to announce that I'm going to be taking uh, my work with the Roots of Progress and expanding it into a new nonprofit effort to launch and accelerate uh, the careers of public intellectuals in progress studies. This is a bit of a pre-announcement. We're going to do a formal announcement probably next week. You all are some of the first to hear about this. And along with this, I want to also pre-announce that we are soon going to be launching a search for a CEO of this effort. I'm going to be the founder and president, re remaining as sort of the spokesman and the face of this, of this effort. But I want to focus as much as possible on my intellectual work, including the book that I'm writing. And so I'm looking for a partner uh, to, to help with the leadership and the management um, of this effort. In terms of how you can get involved, well, um, depends on who you are. If you're a scientist, an engineer, uh, an entrepreneur, you are already contributing to progress. So keep it up. Uh, and I hope you can seek inspiration and courage from the progress movement. Uh, and I encourage you to raise your level of ambition. If you are a historian, economist, or a philosopher, you should be incorporating progress into your work. Uh, I bet it fits in there one way or another, even if it's not your primary focus. If you're an educator or a journalist or someone else whose job is to communicate, communicate about progress. It should be part of the ideas that you get out there. If you're a writer or an artist, inspire people to create progress. Help paint that vision of the future. If you are involved in policy or government, help remove obstructions and roadblocks that get in the way of progress. If you're a parent, make sure that your children learn the story of progress as a part of their education. It's not normally taught in school. And whoever you are, educate yourself. Learn about the history of progress. Help spread the word. And when I copied this slide from a previous presentation, there was an obvious third bullet point that I'm not allowed to say because of Ocon policy. So you can just guess you know, what it might be. <laughs> Let me say, um, uh, I'm going to conclude with some lessons that I have learned in this journey for anybody who wants to um, enrich yourself intellectually or engage uh, intellectually with the world. First, read broadly. 
Um, read from a broad variety of authors, and definitely don't stay within your own intellectual community. Um, I used to have like a really strong preference for sort of reading and listening to things done by other objectivists. And um, my intellectual world was, was much expanded when I just decided I was going to read you know, from all over the place. Similarly, explore other intellectual communities. Uh, in particular to this audience, I'll recommend a community that calls itself the Rationalists. They are not rationalistic. It's about using reason. Um, check out the site lesswrong.com and the essays there. Uh, my favorite blogger is Scott Alexander. Um, Julia Galef and Eliezer Yudkowsky have, uh, have also have a, a bunch of interesting things to say. Um, it, will, it will enlarge your world. Continuing to riff on this theme, I would say, um, when you think about how to choose your intellectual diet, um, when you're choosing what to, the, your literal diet, what to eat, you know, your body is going to passively uh, process those nutrients. And so you want to be really careful what you put in your body. But when you think about your intellectual diet, you are not passively processing what you, the intellectual material you consume. You are actively and volitionally processing it. And you can filter out the good from the bad. So don't be that worried about taking in bad ideas. Um, you should be more concerned about how do I find all the best ideas. And sometimes the best ones are mixed in with bad ones. So you know, if, if you read a book, you should, you should judge you know, a book that you read by how much you can learn from it, not by how much you agree with it. If you read a book and you agree with all of it, but you also already knew all of it, you didn't really add anything to your stock of knowledge. Right? If you read a book and you vehemently disagree with half of it, but the other half is really intriguing and new to you and maybe changes your worldview, that was valuable. Um, you should really choose more based on, um, more based on content, uh, sorry, less based on content and more based on method, right? Choose the writers who you think are intelligent, well-read and well-researched, intellectually honest, clarity of exposition, you know, that sort of thing, rather than are they saying the right things, right? Or do they agree with the right ideas? Um, I would also say whatever you choose to research, go deep. Get into the details, um, get into the weeds, into the dirt, right? get your, roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty um, and, and learn all about it. Don't just skim over the surface. Um, you will be uh, prone to armchair philosophizing if you do too much of that. And focus on something positive, not just on the negatives. Right? Think about, uh, you know, even, even, even if you are thinking about some negative trend, think about the positive value that you want to um, understand and, and defend within that. If I put those last points together in sort of a, you can imagine sort of a two by two where the vertical axis here is you know, affect from negative to positive and the horizontal axis is concreteness from abstract to concrete. So you know, if you're in the sort of upper left, uh, you are, uh, you know, that's abstract and positive, okay, you can get a little fluffy. Right? If you're in the other corner, c concrete and negative, you're really, you're just kind of complaining. Um, if you're in the abstract and negative quadrant, you really risk just kind of being a vituperative you know, tirade of like, this development is evil because it violates individual rights, period, underline, and that's your whole essay, right? Like, um, so my general advice is to uh, shift yourself you know, uh, at least somewhat into the upper right corner, right? Focus on the positive and, uh, and, and get into the concretes of it. That's what I did with the Roots of Progress. Finally, acknowledge and engage with inconvenient facts. So in your research, if you get into the details, you will find things that don't fit or don't seem to fit the story, right? the narrative, the ideas that you had coming in, your overall you know, theme or thesis. It's really tempting to ignore these, to dismiss them, to sweep them under the rug, to minimize or downplay them, to say they don't really matter or you know, whatever. And um, I encourage you to try to, with, with full intellectual honesty and courage, just embrace the facts. If they seem to be important, you know, really dig into them. Um, it might, you, you might just emerge with a more refined and nuanced kind of version of the idea you went in with. It might actually change your mind. Either way, no matter what happens, you will come out better for it, you know, more in touch with reality and closer to the truth. Okay, my final words, I just want to uh, give a, a broader perspective on why I'm hopeful and excited about this movement. One of the most important inflection points in human history was the beginning of the 1600s uh, and the beginning of the scientific revolution 
particularly when philosophers, such as Francis Bacon, started really um, understanding what was going on here and identifying it explicitly. Bacon knew the power of people's ideas about progress to affect progress itself. In his famous work, Novum Organum, he said that the greatest obstacle to progress is that men despair and think things impossible. And he was there to tell people that there was indeed an enormous amount of opportunity in the world. Bacon and his contemporaries had only a handful of examples to look at. The voyages of discovery and the new continents that they uncovered. The discovery of magnets and the invention of the compass. Gunpowder, the printing press. And from these small handful of examples, they extrapolated out to a vision of a scientific and industrial revolution. A vision that they stayed, they and their descendants stayed true to for 200 years before seeing it come into fruition. I'm still in awe of that. Our job is so much easier. Today, progress is not something to prophecy or theorize about or philosophize about for the future. It's a reality of the present and the past. It's the dominant reality of the last 200 years. And the examples are literally all around us. And in order to communicate, we have not only the printing press, but the internet. So if Bacon and his contemporaries did it, so can we. Thank you. Now, how much, how much, I know I went a little over. How much time do we have for questions? You have 12 minutes. OK. Be brief, and I'll try to be brief. OK, brief. That will be hard. So in the science, uh, in the progress movement, there is a huge disagreement, I think, uh, scholarly disagreement about the role of science, and especially like abstract science, and then that tweaking and artisan, like let's say industrial uh, revolution, some put more importance on artisans and just tweaking without actually knowing anything about Bacon, yep. Newton, or whatever. And like Mocker and Allen had huge disagreement, like McCloskey. I have a spiel about this. Do you want to hear it? Sorry? I, I have a spiel, but I know the topic. Do you want to hear what I say on this topic? It, probably. Okay, yeah, I just want to so, hear um, So I have a few essays on this and a talk that I gave on my, on my site. And briefly, um, I think, uh, so it's very true that a lot of inventions were created with, uh, especially in the very early Industrial Revolution, um, like uh, uh, textile mechanization, were created without a lot of input from theoretical science. Uh, and it's also very true that in any invention, anywhere, anytime, there's a lot of tinkering, and it's not just like a straightforward deduction of, scientific, of known scientific principles. When it gets to the point that it's a straightforward deduction of known principles, it isn't even invention anymore. It's just engineering. Um, but uh, science is, I think, a little underrated. Uh, it actually, uh, it, if, you, if you look for the right kind of science, there's actually a lot of influence uh, of science on early inventions. Um, and uh, there's also a, uh, an influence of scientific method, even on the tinkerers who are engineering. Um, there was an, uh, a, through science, uh, there was a, a method of system, making systematic and quantitative observations, which engineers like John Smeaton did in the 1700s, um, you know, when he was uh, experimenting, improving water wheels or steam engines or making, uh, uh, finding the best types of cement. He went through a very methodical process, and he was explicitly motivated by Isaac Newton and his achievements. Um, uh, more broadly, I think it's a mistake to think about science and invention as two separate things that were going on. I think they were really part of a broader enlightenment and uh, project to, and even pre-enlightenment project to collect useful knowledge, to systematize it, to communicate it, and to, and to make use of it. And um, it's natural when people began to do this that that knowledge was in isolated pockets, like some, theory, some scientific theory here, some inventions there. And over time, as that web of knowledge grew, it, it, it was able to be connected, and scientific principles could apply directly to invention, which you see very strongly by the end of the 19th century. That's my brief summary. We have a question from the chat. Sure. Can you comment on whether your organization will be consistent in its moral foundations, moral fundamentals, or whether it will be sort of a broad umbrella like the libertarian movement? 
Um, neither. <laughs> so my work, my personal work, I try to be consistent to what I believe about moral fundamentals. Um, when, uh, when we are uh, funding the work of other progress intellectuals, um, I don't intend to hold them to a particular moral approach. I'm interested in hearing from people I think are intelligent and intellectually honest and have interesting things to say. Um, that doesn't mean that I think they're all right. It just means that I'm, I'm willing to fund people I don't completely agree with right? and, and, and have some disagreements and have a, an ongoing debate about that. Thanks for your talk. I really appreciated it. Um, quick question. If you were to map out sort of the area of influence that you want to have in, the, in this space versus what you sort of happily dedicate to others because you think they're doing a great job versus things that you think are not covered and need work, like how, how, how would you position what you want to achieve relative to what others are doing? Does that make any sense? Because there's a lot of actors, but I, yeah. it wasn't clear to me who was doing what. What I personally am focusing on is um, the history, telling the story of progress, and beginning to develop the philosophy of progress. Um, and I think I can contribute greatly to both of those. Um, there's a lot of specialized topics that I think I'll probably end up leaving for others. Um, I mentioned like this, like I've done very little on the history of construction. There's a guy who writes a great blog about the history and the present of construction. Um, those are some examples. So there's, I mean, I listed uh, like a whole bunch of topics for intellectual work, and I won't be able to go into most of them because each one could you could devote a whole career to. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Very illuminating, thank you. So <clears throat> doubling down on intellectual work, I hope I can, um, you can entertain a meta question. You are growing your career, you, you've, you've left uh, the work of creating products and services for the work of creating intellectual ideas and thought. And I know that uh, as objectivists, we're, we're interested in the free market economy and, you know, this whole idea of a nonprofit and ARI being one. You know, where does, how do you, you've made a journey of creating a, um, a living this way. What are your thoughts about an, um, the work of being an intellectual? and funding it in a way that's consistent with objectivism? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, great question. So I wrote an essay on this website oh, in which I said that anything that can be for profit should be. And then I went and created a nonprofit. So um, <laughs> why did I do that? Partly just because there's a lot of funding available to, to get my work going, and it just made sense. Um, but uh, my plan is that um, no public intellectual, including myself, will um, uh, exist within this nonprofit organization forever. The goal of uh, our programs will be to uh, launch and accelerate and spin you out, and for, you, for each intellectual to find their own path and way of supporting themselves. That could be through you know, book sales and speaking fees. It could be through consulting, uh, a consulting business. It could be that they go get a job in academia or with some other uh, you know, research institute. Etc. But we want people to find ways to become independent, and I think that is sort of the, um, you know, the equivalent of a for-profit business needing to make it on its own by, you know, making a profit uh, by producing, you know, products that people will pay you for. As an intellectual, people should be willing to pay you for your product, just like any business, right? So I want people to, to prove themselves that way, including myself. Hi, Jason. I just want to say, for the record, this is my favorite talk of Ocon 2022. Aww. I'm telling you. Is, uh, <laughs> You're too kind. Uh, no, no, I'm just being totally objective. So um, <laughs> today's your first day, right? You just showed up. You just showed up today, and this is the first talk you went to. I'm not. A, I'm so not far. a plant. And okay, uh, seriously, um, so I just wanted to, and I, I want to talk to you afterwards because sure. I work at a place that I'd love to have your materials to put be put in front of. Okay, so. Um, I mean, in terms of morality, and um, I know in objectivism we focus on altruism as evil, as you know, this is what's wrong with it, this is what's going to happen, it's going to lead to disaster. A lot of people also, in, in, well, Ayn Rand talked about um, altruism and the virtue of selfishness um, as basically a, a half-baked morality, just a fraction of morality. It's only going to a answer the question, who benefits? Um, so you could, um, somebody could, uh, take the idea of rational egoism and say this is a progress approach to morality. Well, we've talked because you know, when, like for instance, reading Steven Pinker, you know, he ends up coming. He uses morality in terms of 
this is what we need to do to help other people and you know and all, being altruistic um, and it really misses the point it's really exasperating to read him and other thinkers and you can you can say you know rational egoism is a progress approach you know we've talked about morality as something that is is just answering one question but we have all these other questions to answer and here's a new approach everybody <laughs> you know so yeah. I would, um, so right now I'm focusing on the progress in technology and industry. Someday I would love to turn my focus to progress in morality and society. And uh, I'd love to write a book on that. And I suspect that a theme of that overall would be increasing individualism um, in society over time. Um, and some of these themes are unpopular, uh, like you know, the nuclear family, right? People not living in generational households, but le actually leaving home and not living with their parents as adults, you know? Um, that's controversial, but like, I think that's a very good thing. Um, and in general, I think one of the benefits of, um, and it's related to material progress, is that we just have more ability to choose our values in life. We have more ability to, these days than ever before, to choose what career we do, where we live, uh, who we marry, if anybody, you know, and when we do so, uh, whether to have children and how many to have and when to have them. Um, so all of these things are, are much more a choice. Um, how we express ourselves in, in fashion and, you know, all sorts of things. Um, you know, a medieval peasant had almost no choice in any of these things. And uh, today we have an enormous amount, and I think that's a huge um, benefit. And some of that came about through material progress, but obviously also some of it came about through changes in ideas. Okay, I'm getting the two-minute sign, so I'll just stop there. Hi, thank you. Um, you've mentioned a little bit about how to justify the moral value of progress by connecting it to human well-being. And I was wondering if there's work done in the progress movement to uh, make this yeah, a step or justificatory process a little bit more explicit. So what is the way in which progress is a moral value and what are the different ways in which it supports uh, human well-being? Yeah, uh, so I actually co-hosted a workshop uh, a few months ago on the moral foundations of progress studies, co-hosted with Greg Salmieri, who's also a speaker here at uh, UT Austin. And we got about 30 people from a, a broad variety of, of moral approaches. And uh, we had some really interesting discussions. The biggest thing for me that came out of that was a, uh, a focus on the concept of human well-being and on different theories of well-being. It turns out within uh, ethical philosophy, right, within the field, there are many competing theories about what is human well-being and what does it consist of. Is it just happiness? Is it um, some uh, list of things that are just good for you because they're just good, you know, and it's for your own good, damn it, right? Is it something in between, some notion of uh, value fulfillment? Um, and uh, I, think, I think that's really where it starts. Because if you understand, depending on how you understand well-being, I think you'll lead to different ideas of what counts as true progress. All right, thank you. Can we squeeze in one? Okay, talk yeah, fast. You can, make, you can make it quick. I just, I was curious if you could speak to some of your personal goals. So you talked about the goals of the movement and the work needing to be done, but for you, like, will you have been successful in 20, 30 years if you've had massive impact if you've changed some of the minds of you know the great the smart people you're working with if you've gotten to learn a bunch more or answer certain questions yeah and how do you rank those goals for yourself? all i mean all of those um let me just pick out one that might not be obvious but i think is really important if there is a single narrow audience that i could reach i want to reach the scientists and the engineers the inventors the founders who mm. are actually creating progress and i want them to know that their work has moral meaning and that they are engaged in a noble quest, part of the grand story of human progress to, to better the human condition. And I want them to take inspiration and courage from that. So if I can, you know, like the best thing, um, the best thing in the world would be in 20 or 30 years, somebody has cured aging or has, you know, um, has, has created the first working fusion energy plant or something. And they come to me and they say, when I was 19 years old, I read your book, and it set me off in this course in life. That would break my heart and would be the most wonderful thing. So thank you. Ditto.